Hi, everybody, um, and everybody local and on live stream. I want to welcome Kara Richardson Whiteley here. Her work as a plus size adventurer has been featured in New York Times, Self, Backpacker, Weight Watchers, Red Book, and also on Oprah's Life Class and Good, Mon Good Morning America. We're very happy that she was able to take time out of her schedule to come visit us at Google and um, share her story with us. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Oh, don't need that. Yeah. So, hi everybody. Um, I just want to get the lay of the land here. How many of you have climbed Kilimanjaro? Anybody? Okay, so nobody in the room. Does anybody here want to climb Kilimanjaro? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Does anybody want to be convinced not to climb Kilimanjaro? Okay, three or four. Okay, got it. So, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about. Um, you know, my story, I speak all over the country about my journey um, up mountains and sometimes up the scale too. So I'll, I'll share a little bit of both. And since there are people in the room who um, have the interest of climbing Kilimanjaro, if you still at the end of the presentation still have that interest, I'll go over some tips. And um, you know, you can also contact me afterwards also if you have any follow-up questions. So my journey, um, up Kilimanjaro began when I was more than 360 pounds. And at that time, I could barely hike a staircase. Um, I couldn't even walk around the block without being completely out of breath, totally uninterested in continuing. And I started to think to myself, because I was about to turn 30 years old, that I wasn't living life anymore. And you know, you might think to yourself, maybe you'll meet somebody who's really heavy or somebody who struggles with weight and you just don't get it. Like, why did they get so big so fast? Or, you know, why can they never get, get it right? It's just food, right? It's not heroin or it's not, um, you know, it's not alcohol. But for me, um, my struggle with weight started when I was um, nine years old and my parents divorced and my father pretty much up and left my life. And then when I was 12, I was sexually assaulted. So, you know, it started with these really big traumatic things. That's when I started to use food for comfort. And, um, you know, it, it started with these huge things, but then little by little, I used food for everything. And I really, truly sugar-coated my life where I wasn't feeling happy, I wasn't feeling sad, I was just feeling pretty comfortably numb. Because even when you know my parents were on the brink of divorce, I literally would hide in the pantry, like to, hear, to just drown out their screamings by chewing food. And when I was in the midst of being sexually assaulted, the only thing I could think of to make it stop and to get out of the situation was to get up and go to the kitchen and offer the guy something to eat. And it threw him through such a loop that it kind of ended right there at that moment. So in many ways, food saved me. But as I was approaching my 30th birthday, because at the time I thought that was getting pretty old, I'm now 40, <laughs> um, I started to think like, well, I'm not getting any younger. And I have so many things that I want to do with my life. And I knew that I really, I really wanted to be a hiker girl because even though I wasn't active at all and I wasn't exercising and I wasn't really a member of a gym or anything like that, my life would light up, my mind would just come you know, into that dream phase. Anytime I would get one of those adventure travel catalogs in the mail, do you know what I'm talking about? Those glossy pictures of the Alps and Machu Picchu and Kilimanjaro. But at that time, I used to do what a lot of people who struggle with their weight do. I'd say to myself, well, I'm going to do that when I lose weight. And like, like I would say to myself, I'll go to the doctors when I lose weight. I'll buy that dress or I'll buy something fancy to wear when I lose weight. So as I approached this birthday, I realized that you know, it was time to just get moving no matter what. And I decided that I would just start to hike. I would start to just be a hiker girl. And even though I'm not um, a Patagonia model, of course, I could start with things like a water bottle. I could carry a water bottle. I could take flat hikes, because I live in New Jersey and there's lots of those. <laughs> um, and the more I hiked, the more I enjoyed it. My husband, he's, 
he's actually a marathoner. He's done seven so far. Um, so he would hike with me, and he would just go up on the, the trail, and he would be far, far ahead of me, and then he'd tap his leg like he was calling a dog. And instead of yelling at him, I would muster my energy to go faster and hike harder. And suddenly, I was the one who was picking the harder trails. I was the one who was, um, I was the one picking more strenuous things to do. And so, as I got moving with this journey, I started to think about like I need a goal, right? And so I picked this particular mountain as a goal. Does anybody happen to know where it is? No? It's called Camel's Hump, and it's Vermont's second highest peak because it looks like the back of a camel. And so um, anyway, I chose this mountain in particular because when I was in college at the University of Vermont, that's when my weight went over the 300 pound mark. And obviously, I wasn't doing any hiking at the time. The only walking that I did was to the bars because they had 25 cent draft night. And that seemed to make a lot of financial sense to me and to class. And so even though I grew up in Vermont and I did hike Camel's Hemp and during a fourth grade field trip, because that's what they do on field trips in Vermont, they hike mountains. Um, when I was in college, my friend said, hey, it's a beautiful day, a lot like it is today. Great sunshine. It's June. Let's go hike Camel's Hump. So I thought, hey, OK, sure, I'll go along with you. And um, 20 minutes into this five-hour hike, I was just completely sucking wind. I mean, absolutely out of shape, unable to continue. I had that feeling that many marathoners do at like mile 20, where you, know, you have lead leg and you can't move another inch. And so I told them everything like, oh, I haven't been feeling well, and I think my stomach hurts. I must have eaten something funny. But the truth of the matter is I wasn't moving at all. And instead of having it being one of those Oprah aha moments, that moment where you know, everything changes, I went to the bottom of the mountain that day, and I ate the two things that were in my backpack, a half pound bag of M&Ms and a, liter, a half liter bottle of Diet Coke, because I mentioned I'm not so good at math. So I thought they equaled each other out. But for years and years, I lived that way. And I decided that if I was going to hike, and I was going to be a hiker girl, and I was going to move more, I needed to conquer Camel's Hump. And so I hiked and I hiked. And on the eve of my 31st birthday, I, you know, I conquered Camel's Hump. And the funny story about that is that I trained and I trained. I, I trained on one of those moving staircases, you know, the staircase that never ends. Do you have one of those at your gym? Um, that was like my best friend while training for this. And um, I thought about it every day, how I'm going to go to the top of Camel's Hump. And I decided I was going to do a sunrise hike because I thought that sounded glorious and amazing and like one of those once in a lifetime kind of hikes. So I get up to the top of the mountain, and I'm hiking by myself, and then I'm like, geez, I don't have anybody to take my picture. And so suddenly, this woman and her daughter start walking up with a dog. I'm like, oh, this is such an incredible hike. You know, how, many, how long have you been training for this? And they're like, oh, we do this every morning, because I live <laughs> at the base of the mountain. So I was joining a different kind of lifestyle. You know, Even though it was exciting and new for me, um, this is something that other people did every day. And so I was really kind of joining the club when it came to hiking. I also, um, you know, once I conquered Kemmel's Hump, well, then the sky's the limit, right? Um, then I went down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and thankfully back up again, because that is 10 miles of brutal <laughs> up. Has anybody done the Grand Canyon here? Yeah, it's rough. I mean, you really have to time your rests, your, how much food you're eating, how much water you can bring. It's a real um, endurance test. And then, um, then we took on Vermont's highest um, peak, which is Mount Mansfield, which to this day is the hardest mountain that I ever hiked. Because, well, the truth is, is that we ended up hiking down the wrong side of the mountain. So thank goodness the Vermont Brewers Fest was the same day. <laughs> so. So as I was doing all this hiking, all this amazing hiking, taking care of my body, this great thing happened. I started to lose a lot of weight, so much weight that I had lost almost 100 pounds. And this very strange thing started happening to me. Whenever I'd go, especially to the bathroom at work, women would follow me in there and say, like, so what are you doing? Why are you losing all this weight? Did you get the surgery? 
are you on Weight Watchers? Are you doing South Beach? Because that was really hot at the time. And so, um, and then they, I, they'd be really interested in how long did it take you and what did you eat and what are you eating for breakfast you know, tomorrow and what are you going to have for dinner and can I join you for lunch? And people would like turn and look every time I got something to eat. And it's all they cared about. And these people who never once gave an inkling about anything in my life wanted to know everything that was going in my mouth. And for someone who had used food for so long to kind of cover emotions and kind of cover myself, it was incredibly intimidating. Um, so I decided that I wanted to have another big goal, but I also wanted to deflect this attention I was getting. So I started to set my sights on Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain that you can hike to the top of. In other words, no ice axes, no ropes, no supplemental oxygen. Have you seen Into Thin Air? Right? It's not that. <laughs> it's a long, drudgery kind of journey where you're like five and a half days up the mountain, one and a half days down, but you can do it on your own two feet if you train really well. So I figured that's going to be the, the huge goal that I'm going to focus on. And because it's such an iconic mountain, I mean, even in this room, there's like five people who really actually do want to do this. Um, there's, you can really do it to raise money for almost any charity. And so I thought, since I'm going to be doing it in Africa, that I would do something that would give back to Africa. Um, and so I, I did a little Google search, and I looked up, you know, Kilimanjaro climbs, AIDS orphans, because that's what I really wanted to raise money for. And um, lo and behold, I found Global Alliance for Africa, which is a Chicago-based charity. And the thing that they do to raise money for their organization is Kilimanjaro hikes. And so um, I signed up right away. And then any time that those women who asked me about my weight <laughs> asked me what I was doing, I'm like, well, I'm training for Kilimanjaro, and here's how you can donate to AIDS orphans, and I raised $12,000. So talk about deflecting attention there. Um, so to train for um, Kilimanjaro, you know, there's a couple things you should know. One is that it is 19,343 feet. Um, that's really high. It's in Tanzania, Africa. The keys to success are to go pole pole. Does anybody know Swahili in the room? Yes, slowly, slowly, that's right. That's the key to success. And so if I was going to sign up for a mountain and they said, go as slow as you possibly can, I'm like, yes, this is my kind of mountain. Um, the other keys are drink a lot of water, up to five liters a day. That's a lot. Um, and the other thing is have a positive attitude. In fact, the only way that you can tell if somebody's not going to make it to the top, if, for those of you who actually do want to hike the mountain, um, if you're in your pre-climb briefing and somebody is complaining about how they hate camping and they hate the outdoors, they're pretty much like the goner by like day two, so just so you know. But otherwise, you don't know who's going to make it and who's not. You know, Martha Stewart, Martha Stewart made it to the top. Ann Curry, the newscaster for um, NBC, didn't. Martina Navratilova didn't. So you just don't know by looking at someone whether or not they're going to be able to do it. So I like those odds. So to, to train, I focused on three things, strength, stamina, and spirit. Strength is pretty obvious. You know, you're doing a lot of hiking, but you want to also um, strengthen your quads and your back because you're holding a backpack for so long. Um, you want to strengthen the muscles around your knees so you support your body and all the joints that need to get you there. Stamina. Look, I live in New Jersey. There were some mountains I actually had to hike twice to, to get up to the level of being able to climb Kilimanjaro. But spirit, I think, was one of the most important things where I took yoga classes, one, because they do a lot of breath work. And I thought it was going to be really important for me to feel like I was in control of my breath. My breath wasn't going to be in control of me. And so even though there, there were breath exercises that I did, it started to like really kind of get me in the rhythm of really being conscious of air in, air out, and conserving air where I could. Um, but what I really loved about yoga as part of the training, yes, flexibility, strength, all that stuff is great. But every time I went down into Savasana, you know, the part where it looks like everybody's sleeping and they did nothing for like the 45 minute class, um, that was when I started to imagine myself at the top of the mountain before I got there because I had to believe 
that I could do this goal before I did it. So you can do a lot of routes up Kilimanjaro. I, um, in my three climbs, have climbed the Rongai route each time. It's the route on the side, the Kenya side of the mountain. It's a little more remote. Um, maybe when we camped, we saw two or three other groups, and that's it. On the way down the mountain, we went the Coca-Cola route, which is much more, there's much more traffic, and so you really did see a lot more people. Um, a lot of people look at this middle photo, and they say, Oh, how wonderful, they're just starting their, um, it's okay. But a lot of people look at this photo and they say like, oh, how cute, they're just starting their journey up Kilimanjaro. And I have to explain to them like, no, 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 that's, that's four days in. <laughs> and you still have to do, you have to like, summit night is from here up to the top and then halfway down the mountain in one day. It's 15 hours of hiking. So, and, and, and things like altitude headaches are a real, they're a real concern. And this is Lisa, who actually did make it to the top, but it was, you know, 50-50 whether or not she was actually going to continue or not at that point. So hiking Kilimanjaro is an amazing thing. You dream about it for months, you prepare, you visit REI more times than you probably have in your entire life, right? You spend more money on gear probably as much as you paid for your plane tickets. <laughs> But then comes summit night. And when you're at summit night, and I mentioned that you're camping kind of high up on that slope that I just pointed to, when you start your summit attempt, it is 15 hours of hiking. So why not start at midnight, right? Because just get it, start, get it started and get it over with. Um, when you open your tent door, you are so high up that there's stars above you, there's stars beside you, there's stars below you. When you are so proud of yourself that you've put on every possible layer of gear, everything. You look like that kid in a Christmas story, you know, I can't put my arms down, or, you know. Um, and you've managed to tie your shoelaces at about 15 or 16,000 feet. That alone is like, you're so proud of yourself that you can't even imagine. Um, so then you walk out your tent door and you join your group. You try to stomach a little bit of breakfast. And then, you start walking in this formation with your, with your guide, and they're singing you Swahili love songs and lullabies as you're walking in this beautiful formation, lockstep, everybody's in this together. And that's really wonderful for the first hour. Maybe the second. <laughs> but by the third hour, you're thinking, I think this guide is lost. Because unlike in states where these, these big, trailblazes where you know exactly where you're going. There's, you know, I'm going to follow the red dot trail all the way up the mountain. There isn't that on Kilimanjaro. There's just these gravelly trails of scree near the top where you take one step up and you slide halfway back. And you take another step up and you slide halfway back. And it is so incredibly frustrating. So, um, <laughs> Then you're, you know, you're really irritated at this point. And by hour four, you've pretty much, um, you've pretty much got your I quit speech down. Like, listen, um, I really want a fresh shower and a cold beer or a cold water that comes from a bottle, not from whatever water source you got this stuff from. Um, I, you guys are like sisters or brothers to me. You've lent me toilet paper. I feel like we're family, but I'm going to leave now. <laughs> I'm going down the mountain the way I came. So right when you feel like you just cannot take this journey anymore, that's when the sun comes up. So on Kilimanjaro, especially on summit night, it is truly darkest before dawn. That's when you really have to dig in and just keep pushing forward when you feel like you just can't. Unless, of course, you're suffering from something really like altitude sickness. But if usually your mind gives out before your body does. Um, and if you're climbing Kilimanjaro, usually you stop at Gilman's Point where you can um, have tea. A lot of times the porters and guides have tea for you there. And you're so high at this point that you watch the sunrise over Africa and the horizon <coughs> is curved. And I, when I first noticed this, I thought maybe I was tripping because of the lack of oxygen. <laughs> but another pe a lot of other people confirmed that it actually the horizon does look completely curved because you are so high up on, on the world. But maybe they had lack of oxygen, too. So 
From there, you can go on to Uhuru Peak, which is the true summit of Kilimanjaro. And the first time I did it, um, I hiked with my husband. And for the record, he's only done one of my three climbs. <laughs> so with all my training, I kept thinking about the way up, the way up, the way up. But what goes up must come down, right? And so um, it can be kind of fun. I mean, you, you're doing this scree running. So now that scree that was so devastating to you on summit night, so difficult to manage, is kind of fun because now you're doing this almost like a, a vertical run down a beach. Does that make sense? So you're trying to make, have fun with it where you're just kind of running and running and running. And it really actually helps rinse out the lactic acid that's kind of built out in your, um, in your body. But in, you just try to enjoy the journey down even though your legs kind of feel like jello for all the, the, that you've put it through. So as we're doing this, as we're way, making our way down the mountain that first time, all we could think about was getting to a hotel, shelter, anything over our heads, a warm meal at a table, on a plate, you know, something that we could really enjoy, and of course, a shower. Um, our leader at the time, she said to us, she's like, hey guys, don't forget to look up every once in a while. And so on this particular trip, where we were at that moment on the mountain, I looked up in the horizon and I saw a mountain that looked a lot like Camel's Hump. And I thought to myself, you know, gosh, if I had never done Camel's Hump, if I had never made that my giant goal, I could never be here. And so it really does make a difference. Those small steps, those intro, you know, interim goals. So even if it's like a 5K for you, like something you've never done before, you never know where that may lead. And it might just lead to the 5K, and that alone is a huge accomplishment. And Camel's Hump at the time was a huge accomplishment, but you know that interim goal led me to the roof of Africa. So, you know, in the end, I did lose 120 pounds, and um, the women were very excited about that, who would follow me to the bathroom. And after I came back from Kilimanjaro, the next thing they wanted to know. So what's your next adventure? What are you doing? You know, are you going to do Everest? <laughs> are you going to do Machu Picchu? Uh, are you going to do, you know, if, if Wild were out at the time, they would have been like, oh my god, you totally got to do the Pacific Coast Trail, right? Um, but I had a whole other adventure in mind. It required another language and a lot of new gear. And that was to have a baby. <laughs> so. Um, like a lot of women who struggle with their weight, I put on a ton of it back on when I was pregnant. In fact, I put on 70 pounds during my nine months of preg pregnancy. Um, and I went from someone that had been to the roof of Africa to someone who could barely hike across my living room because I had sciatica so bad, which is like this lightning bolt down your leg. And it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing that I had done so much. In one year, I lost all this weight. And then in months, I'd put half of it back on again. Um, and so now those women wouldn't even look me in the eye anymore. They wouldn't hold the door for me anymore. Nobody really wanted to talk about weight anymore with me. And so I was really feeling stuck and isolated. And I started to do those things that I did when I struggled with my weight before, like I'd bow out of events because I felt like, oh, I'm too fat. I don't want to go to that reunion. I don't want to go to that party. I haven't seen this person in a long time. I wouldn't be in family photos. In fact, there's almost no pictures of me when I was pregnant. And I think it's because I didn't want people to take my picture. I was embarrassed of how I felt about myself. Um, and I was really stuck. And I started to think about, you know, what was it about that first Kilimanjaro climb. How come I was able to really rise above and just go do it? And I thought to myself, well, it was because I was working for a cause that was bigger than myself. You know, whenever I didn't want to work out, I thought about, I'm climbing this mountain for AIDS orphans in Africa. I'm raising the money for them. Who am I to not eat well? Who am I to not train today? They're depending on me. Um, and even though if I didn't make the, mount, the, um, the top of the mountain, I still would have, the donation still would have gone to the charity, but I felt like I had a responsibility to do my best. And so in my post-pregnancy mind, I thought, well, I've got a great plan. <laughs> I'm going to do something called the Save the World Workout, <laughs> where I'm going to do a different event for charity 
every month of the year. And that way, I would force myself to get out and you know, be a part of an event where they were raising money for charity, where I have to sign up for it, show up. And it really did a great job of just at least getting me moving again, because that's something I wasn't doing at all. So even though some of the events burned more calories than others, like um, you know the, the Flying Pig Marathon, I actually walked the whole marathon course. Um, but the Penguin Plunge in Vermont, which is jumping in Lake Champlain in Burlington, Vermont, in February, where they actually have to cut out a minivan-sized chunk of ice and you jump in the water. <laughs> that was more about, you know, that was more about me like kind of getting out of my shell again than it was about burning calories. And I'm a little embarrassed about the, um, the profanity I used in front of the former mayor of Vermont. Not Bernie Sanders, but Peter, Peter Clavel. <laughs> um, but I think he might have matched it a little bit, but I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not saying he did. So anyway, um, so it was this great year of just kind of getting out, raising money, doing fun things that I enjoyed again. And I thought, OK, the best thing that I can do is to end the year with a Kilimanjaro climb. And that will finally get me back in that space, that same place where I was successful with weight. I mean, because you know, you see all the advertisements for weight loss products, weight loss surgery, weight loss this, weight loss pills, weight loss all of these programs that you can do, people really want to be in that place again. And I desperately wanted to hang on to something. And I thought Kilimanjaro is going to be the key to that. And so I thought if I just ended with a Kilimanjaro hike, um, I was going to be able to do that. So I did all the events. But the problem was I convinced myself that I was just really good in altitude. And it's just a slow hike to the top. It's all you have to do to get to the top of this mountain. Unfortunately, it isn't. If you're planning on climbing Kilimanjaro, you want to give yourself four months of training in that direction, and that's it. You know, you want to make sure you have time to prepare your body and your mind for this. But the most important thing that I did not conquer was my challenge with food, because I didn't put 70 pounds back on because I was just eating extra ice cream. I was doing the same things that got me into trouble the first time. I was binging. And my real red flag with food is when um, I can't admit what I ate. In fact, my real trouble point with food is when I'm hiding what I've done. So. For those of you who don't struggle with food, I'll just lay it out for you. This is what it looks like. Uh, I'm, I'm the mom in our family, so I do the grocery shop, right? I come home with some ice cream for my kids, and uh, for, uh, for my daughter at the time, and my husband. Um, and we have dessert. We have a nice, healthy portion of ice cream, and that's that. Everybody's happy. We go to bed. The next day, while I'm working from home, I think after lunch, oh, I could use some ice cream or sometimes after breakfast, I could use some ice cream. I have a little bit. I want to be done with it. Then I return to the, the, you know, the fridge or the freezer a few minutes later, maybe an hour later. I want a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And suddenly, I'm like eating the entire container like with a spoon and with the freezer still open. <laughs> and suddenly, I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing is almost gone. Now, how am I, a professional mom, uh, you know, a professional writer, um, you know, a good mom, successful in lots of other things. I mean, I've raised money. I'm a good person. How is it that I can be conquered by a cupcake? And so then I do what I think is the most logical thing. I go back and I have to buy another thing of ice cream to hide the fact that I didn't eat the ice cream in the first place. Now, this is when I'm really in trouble with food. And this is where I was on the eve of this second Kilimanjaro climb. I hadn't dealt with how I was feeling with food. In fact, the hardest thing that I had to write about in Gorge was the scene right before the second climb. Um, because I had purchased some candy in the Amsterdam airport for my daughter and my niece and nephew who were coming to visit for Christmas. And I ate it all, every single bit of it, on the eve of a Kilimanjaro climb. So 
spoiler alert, I didn't make it up the mountain that time. <laughs> um, in fact, it was, it was a pretty devastating fail. And after that point, if I was in the red flag territory before, I was seriously, seriously in trouble with food. Um, I, I did that kind of thing with the ice cream like almost every single day. So I didn't want to hike again. I didn't want to hear about Kilimanjaro again. I didn't want anything to do with mountains until a friend of mine said, hey, remember that trip up Kilimanjaro? Ever since you talked about it with me, I've always wanted to go. And I'd like to do it to train for an Ironman. So my friend would also like to come with me. And together, we will raise a dollar per foot of the mountain for the charity that you love. So $19,343 was on the line for Kilimanjaro if you come with us. <laughs> and then I had my husband's cousin, who is on the cover of Gorge with me, say to me, you know, I'm in a rut. I really need um, to get out of it. Her mom died of cancer, and then her father was murdered on the roadside in um, Moab, Utah, all within a couple years of each other. And she was eating and she was shopping um, to kind of get through those feelings. And so she was putting on a ton of weight. She's like, I just need something to keep me going. So I'll climb Kilimanjaro and I'll raise $5,000 for Global Alliance for Africa if you come with me. I'm like, talk about like backwards peer pressure, right? This is <laughs> so now if I knew if I climbed that I could raise an additional $5,000 for Global Alliance for Africa. So now we're talking about $30,000 for this organization that I really loved. I mean, that's more than enough money to actually build a library in one of the slums in, in Kenya or anything like that. I mean, there's so much that could be done with that amount of money um, for the programs that they use. So I thought, OK, I'll do it. However, if I do it, and this is the story that's in Gorge, um, that I would need to do the work. I would have to do the training. Uh, again, that kind of four to six months of really, really training. However, I needed the most important thing that I needed to do was to love myself where I was and go from there. Because initially, I started to do that thinking like, OK, well, I'm going to lose 20 pounds this month and 10 pounds every month until the hike. And that'll be perfect. And I thought, no, if I set myself up like that, it's going to be a complete failure. What I needed to do was to find a trainer who would train me as I was, that I could be able to climb the mountain at the weight I was at. I did things like I signed up for a half marathon um, in Vermont called the Mad Marathon, um, which is the most mountainous marathon, half marathon I've ever walked. It's incredible. And my husband did that with me to help me train. But more importantly, I needed to understand, like, what is it about food that has so captured me? How come I eat? How come I have this like pattern of existing that is so dangerous to myself? So if I was going to climb the mountain, not only was I going to do it upon my own strength and my own body, I was also going to do the work to understand um, the journey that I had been on. And this, of course, was no walk in the park. I climbed the mountain as if I was carrying you know, another person on my back. I did the hiking as if I was doing that. So I did things like I trained in, in Telluride with my um, husband's cousin, Stacy. Um, and you know, PSA, it's a lot easier to ski down a mountain trail than to hike up it, because that was some serious hiking up some serious um, trails. Those, but it was so gorgeous when I got to the top. And I was doing actually altitude training because you know, those are like 12,000 feet, 14,000 feet um, peaks that we were hiking. Um, so when I was, when I got to the mountain, when I got to there the third time, I was feeling pretty great about myself. I was feeling like I was ready. In fact, so much so that um, by the second day, two people, two of the four people who were with us, the four including myself, were feeling sick, feeling tired, feeling like they had made a mistake, <laughs> like they didn't really want to come up Kilimanjaro, and how could I have said yes to this crazy idea? Um, anyway, 
I started to feel like, yeah, I feel good. And even after that second day on the Rangai route, which is 10 hours of hiking, 10 hours of just drudgery, um, it's not a huge incline, but it is a long slog. The porters and guides actually asked me if, you know, hey, do you need me to carry your backpack like two or three times because they were already carrying backpacks of my, you know, fellow hikers. I'm like, no, no, I feel good. And so, you know, that night when I went to sleep, I was thinking, okay, it's so cold. It was actually so cold that night that our water bottles froze in our tents. So, you know, if you go camping a lot, you know that kind of night. Like, all you want to do is put your sleeping cap on, put yourself in your sleeping bag, go to sleep so you can wake up for when the sun rises and it could possibly be a few degrees warmer when you wake up. So as I was, um, as I was going to sleep, I started to hear rumblings in Swahili in the tent next to me. That's where the porters and guides were hanging out. And I don't know a lot of Swahili, but I do know a couple things. The f most important thing that I know is what they call me in Swahili. My nickname on the mountain for all three climbs was Mama Kubwa, which means big woman, which didn't bother me. You know, that's, you know, that's the way they differentiate me from the other people. They know who they're talking about. But then I started to hear laughter. And it wasn't like Mama Kubwa told this really funny joke, and I'm going to tell you what it is. I knew at that moment that they were making fun of me. And so these are the people that we were paying to help us up the mountain. And I started to feel, for the first time, like, I'm not going to do this anymore. I've done this. This is my third time up the mountain. I know my way back. I'll just get a ride to the hotel, and I'm out. Because I started to think to myself, like, I, I'm not going to do this. If the people that we're paying to support us up the mountain don't think I'm going to make it, how could I possibly make it? So I finally lulled myself to sleep. I remembered things like when I was doing spinning classes and they did you know, these mantras. And I totally tried to get myself into the mode where I was like, OK, I believe in me. I'm going to ignore what they said. But here's the thing about Kilimanjaro. You can't push off things. If it's raining, you put on a rain jacket or you will get soaked. If you're hungry, you need to eat something or you're going to be you know, you're not going to have enough energy to do what you need to do. If you're thirsty, well, then you're far beyond being dehydrated and you need to be drinking, right? So with the same thing goes with emotions. It's a really great mountain to kind of toil through something that you need to figure out because all you have time to do is think. But you have to do something with that emotion. And for me, as someone who's been struggling with their weight for, since she was nine years old, I know when people are making fun of me. And I couldn't just put it off anymore. And I'll just do a quick reading about what happened after that point. So the next morning, I was still feeling it. I was still feeling upset about how they felt, uh, what, they, what they said about me. However far I walked, however much I tried to think of other things, the humiliation of last night was there, and it was raw. I was overcompensating by being perky, a cheerleader, even if I would have never made it on a team, let alone be on top of a pyramid. But being perky and positive was how I usually dealt with everything in public. I needed to confront Kennedy, but in such a way that he would continue guiding me up the mountain safely. So when it came time for a water and pee break amid an outcropping of rocks, I approached our guide what I always, with what I always do when I'm upset or nervous. I smiled. I didn't want him to know that his mocking words made me want to turn back. So there I was, swallowing my true feelings, trying to be nice. After all, his job was not an easy one. He was already carrying Tracy's backpack to help her. But my cheeks burned. I, was always, I always lived with the feeling that I couldn't or shouldn't speak up in the face of bullies, or my abuser, or even my father. I was swallowing, I was used to swallowing my words like 22 rifle shells. So when it came time to say my words, I nearly choked on the first syllable. I want to talk to you about something I said, interrupting a Swahili conversation he was having with our assistant guide. Last night I heard you. You were talking about me. What were you saying? Sorry, Kennedy said. I was pretty sure he was pretending he didn't know what I was talking about. I heard you last night. I heard you making the trails I do when I'm going up and down the trail. I heard you making fun of me. I was talking with some porters who wanted to know, are you sure she's going to make it? I was answering them. They don't believe you're going to make it to the top, Kennedy said. He looked embarrassed. 
Maybe not because of what he said, but for getting caught. From his tone the night before, I couldn't help but think that he was one of the people betting against my success. I knew his laughter, and I believed he was laughing at me. They don't believe it, I asked. Yeah, Kennedy answered, looking away. Did you make any money bets, I asked. You should, I said. Bet on me. Bet on me. So that's the only, the only time in my life probably that I've been able to come back with something to, to say to somebody who's made making fun of me in middle school. It's just, it was uh, uh, you know, an embarrassment. Like I would just hear people making fun of me and I would just run away and then I'd think about it like two days later. And the only thing that I can think of of why I was able to say something with such power and conviction and strength was because Kilimanjaro allowed me to feel strong and so I can ask for what I need for in life. Um, I can do things that I want to do because I was finally standing up for myself. Um, so my wish for you is that you know whatever it is you want to accomplish, if after this talk you want nothing to do with Kilimanjaro, <laughs> Whatever it is, whatever goal you have, is that you continue to bet on yourself because it will always pay off for you in the end. So thanks, and I'll take any questions that you have. Um, I'm planning a Kilimanjaro hike in June. So Great. first one, only hike around the Bay Area. So what do you think will be like most surprising or shocking to me, or what should I do extra to prepare? Okay, so uh, the most surprising or shock being shocking is when you're shopping for hand wipes, multiply the amount that you think you need by about four or five. <laughs> um, you know, the training that you do is pretty obvious. You want to hike up mountains, you want to build strength, you want to build endurance. Um, but the hardest part is the mental part, you know, going past what you think you could possibly do on your own. Um, that's hard, but then also enduring that when you feel kind of yucky about yourself because you haven't showered. I mean, they give you, at least the tour group that I went with, gave you water to wash up and stuff, but you just feel so grimy by the end of it. And that can be kind of tough to um, endure the physical, you know, usually, if, you know, if you hike around home, you do a great day hike, and then you go home, or you go to a hotel and you shower. That's, you know, backpacking is not like that, where you actually have to, um, be where you are and continue being in that mode for several days. So really prepare for the, the, not only the physicality of the mountain, but the emotional part too. Thanks. Yep. I want to know what inspired you to write about this book. Is it the first book that you write? Um, I did write a book that I self-published called Fat Woman on the Mountain, and that was about my first climb. And I, I self-published that. Um, because I, it was 90% done on my computer, and I thought, well, I might as well just share it you know, with the world. But this is my first book with a publisher, and I've been lucky enough to work with Seal Press, which is actually based um, nearby in Berkeley. Um, they're a publisher for women by women. But um, as I was working to, to get the proposal ready, because a nonfiction book, you, you, know, you write a proposal, you don't have to write the whole thing at first, but you have to write a good portion and know where the book is going. My agent, um, Kim Perel, had mentioned that you know, she was looking at the proposal and I was really focusing on the mountain climb. You know, I'm a fat person and I'm climbing this mountain, isn't that great? You know, it was an adventure story. And she and I had a, you know, was a, what was a very difficult call for her to make and say that, you know, this is a great story. Of course, it's important for you to tell this story, but I need you to be more um, open with your struggles with food because that is a, equally as important as the physical struggle to hike a mountain. And um, she assured me, and people, writers like Cheryl Strayed, who's my teacher, um, she wrote Wild that it didn't matter what I put on the table about my issues with food because two-thirds of the United States struggles with weight in some sh way, shape, or form. And so it didn't matter how open or embarrassing I thought a story would be, that there would be a lot of people nodding their head or understanding someone else's behavior because of it. And so that's what I decided to do. And with that advice, I actually changed the title. I had originally called it Big Fat Mountain, which I still think was kind of good title. <laughs> but as I was writing the last scene, um, which is in a gorge, 
I thought, oh my gosh, it has to be gorge because it means so many things to eat too much in the low point between mountains. Um, and also slang for gorgeous, but that's the third meaning. <laughs> but there's mostly those two meanings, of course. Um, so anyway, the, the paradigm of, you know, sometimes you get some feedback, and even though it's difficult to take, um, it really was important for me to hear that and really, um, and right to that point. And once, once she did that, I felt like the floodgates opened. I could share anything. And in, in Fat Woman on the Mountain, I shared about being sexually assaulted and my father, you know, not being a real big part of my life, but um, in Gorge, I really kind of let it all out, which was, it was really important for me to do. Are you planning to climb again by any chance? <laughs> well, I, I think it's safe to say it's time to move on to other mountains. Um, you know, Kilimanjaro three times. I mean, maybe Oprah could ask me to climb it, but that's about it. <laughs> um, but I, I would love to hike Machu Picchu. Um, I, I mentioned I studied with Cheryl Strait. I did that in the French Alps, so I did a lot of hiking when I was there. But the most important thing for me at this point in my life is that hiking comes naturally to me. So it's not something that I put a barrier up because of my size, um, or you know, have I lost 10 pounds? Have I gained 10 pounds? You know, wherever I'm at that scale, that I love it. In fact, so much so that I'm an American Hiking Society ambassador to share that the outdoors are for everybody. Um, but you know, there. My victories today aren't huge mountains. They are things like you know, before I you know, left on these two talks. I did a talk at Purdue, and um, I made sure that, you know, I had my seeds ordered for my community garden plot, so I had healthy things for my family to eat. Um, there are things like going to family swim because putting a bathing suit on for me can be as intimidating as Everest, okay? Let's just be honest here. <laughs> you know, so that I actually am leading an active life no matter where I am on the scale for myself, for my kids, for my future. So you mentioned wipes and I saw the polls and I've read the blogs. You know, what, is there any kind of equipment that you needed that you didn't think you would have needed or that you didn't read about? Well, the, you know, if you go with a reputable tour company, mm -hmm. they will give you a supply list. Yes. So you can feel pretty comfortable about that. Okay. Um, the people at REI won't steer you wrong, usually. <laughs> um, I would say that the most important thing for you to put money into is into your um, socks and boots. Okay. Um, I am not a fancy bag kind of person. Even though there's a Bloomingdale's in the next town mm -hmm. over, I never go there. But if I go to REI, I mean, I dropped $300 Perfect. on a pair of boots. But it's so worth it. Um, I bought a pair of a solos that actually I took up Kilimanjaro three times okay. and all the training in between and the only reason I gave them away at the end was because our guide was wearing Skechers. Okay. You know? Yeah. And so you want to make sure, um, as a side note, if you do decide to climb the mountain, you want to make sure that your guide company um, really takes care of their porters because mm -hmm. it's a, you know, it's considered a good job. However, you know, you want to make sure that they have good footwear, that they have enough to stay warm because you'll see how much you pack and it, mm -hmm. um, it'll depend, you know, there's, there's guidelines about how many pounds it can mm -hmm. be, mm -hmm. but then you see these porters are carrying up all your stuff yeah. and then there's a the tiny little backpack. So okay. um, think about that for okay. sure um, when you go. But um, hiking poles, it's good to start training with them uh -huh. um, oh, even okay. though you don't think you need them mm -hmm. because, you know, it does take a lot out of your shoulders to kind of move with them. Um, so you don't want to be feeling like that is um, mm -hmm. something new for you on the mountain. Mm -hmm. You really don't want anything to feel really totally new for you, any of your gear, except for maybe, maybe gaiters, because those go on the outside of your okay. um, pants. So One last follow-up. Sure. I read somewhere that you wanted your shoes to have a little bit of space, so when you come down, your toe doesn't seem crammed, but that seems kind of odd in the sense that going up, you don't really want loose boots either. Huh. Was that an issue when you came down? Did you feel like your toes are getting smashed? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Okay. You want to feel that with your outfitter, you know, whoever's okay. selling you your boots, mm -hmm. and look up more online about that. Okay. I mean, because I've had, you know, my third climb, by the time I got down the mountain, I had this horrible blister, which I won't describe because <laughs> it's probably like in the adult content, like, you don't want to hear about that. <laughs> on my toe, but I think it's because my laces weren't tight enough. Oh, okay. 
you know, I was probably like too tired to just go down and <laughs> tie them tightly. So, you know, you want to make sure all those things are taken care of. Another thing is you want to make sure your toes are really well clipped, okay. um, your toenails. Um, because if you if you have too long toenails, that will also you'll lose a lot of toenails because of that. Mm -hmm. So lots of tips, lots of footwear. Ask lots of questions. Okay. I mean, the people who work at outdoor stores often do it because they love gear and they love hiking. And so um, if they don't know, then someone else. I'm sure someone on their staff has done a similar hike. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you so much. <laughs>